Hello everyone, this is Nifty255, and welcome back to my KSP modding tutorial series, Volume 2, Plugins and Programming, Episode 1, Node Structure. This volume will focus on plugin development and some of the more advanced programming concepts such as creating user interfaces, loading sounds, and plenty of other exciting things. In today's episode, we will discuss how the game's saving and loading systems work, from your save ship designs to the 12 years strong space program you were just playing. Keep in mind that this tutorial, like the previous, involves programming. As such, you will need Microsoft's Visual Studio programming environment. If you already have Visual Studio, then you are all set for this episode. But if you don't, you can find instructions on how to download, install, and use Visual Studio by clicking the annotation on the screen now. That said, let's get started. Do you remember the config files we've created or modified in the past four episodes? Believe it or not, the game uses the same file structure for everything saved and loaded in throughout the game. This structure, which we'll call the node structure, contains two different data types, nodes and values. A value is simply a variable with a name and any type of value. A value could be an integer value, a decimal value, some text, or even a color if you can write a custom value reader. For example's sake, we'll create that custom color reader later. A node is a container for one or more values, one or more nodes, or even both. This means a single node can contain any number of nodes and any number of values, all at the same time. Because of this, nodes are very useful for organization of data. Using these two data types, it's possible to save and load anything in a format that is still readable in the file itself. The flexibility of this system is evident in the fact that it is used in not only part configuration, but also ship design and game save files. Next, we'll go over how the node structure is organized. In this example, there are two nodes, two values, and one comment. Those of you that already know what nodes are may only see one node, but there are in fact two nodes. The first rule of the node structure is that everything in a node structured file is placed into a top level node. Simply put, just remember that there is always an invisible node that all other nodes and values in the file are inside. Although the top level node has no name according to the node structure, we will call it the root node. It is the root of everything else in the file. Put even more simply, the file is itself a node. With the not so obvious out of the way, you can see that the root node contains one value called mass, and that its value is equal to 1. A value can be named anything by simply changing the text to the left of the equals sign to any text you wish, but the name cannot be more than one word and is typically named such that the very first letter is not capitalized. If this line were in a part config, the game would determine that this part has a mass of exactly one ton. Next in the root node is another node called module. Keep in mind that a node can be named anything by simply changing module to any text you wish, but a node's name cannot be more than one word and is typically written in all caps. A node is defined by writing the name followed by one opening and one closing curly bracket. The curly brackets are what cause the node to act as a container for additional data. Between these two brackets, you can see our second value called name, with a text value of module light. It is important to note that a node with a value called name does not make the text assigned to that value the name of the node. In this example, the node is named module and not module light. This module node merely contains a value called name, Put another way, no value inside a node can name the node. This example is important because KSP's own part config files look like this. In any file with the modules, you will find this. In these cases, the module node is telling the game that this part contains a module and that the type of module is determined by the name value inside that module node. Lastly, this example includes a comment consisting of three lines. In order to write a comment, the comment must be preceded by two forward slashes. Everything after these two slashes on that one line is considered a comment and is ignored by the game. It is also possible to place a comment after a node or value by simply adding a space, a double forward slash, and then the comment immediately after the node or value. Now let's move on to another example. This one was taken from a config file included in a mod I'm working on called Kerbal Mechanics which injects part failure modules into stock parts without modifying the parts config files. I'll show you how to do this in a future episode, but for now, let's analyze this node structure. The first thing we see is a node called injection, but remember that this injection node is actually inside the invisible root node. 
Next, inside the injection node, we see a value called part name. This value, set to engine large skipper, is what determines which part my custom module should be injected into. Next in the injection node are three nodes called module. At first, it may seem like having multiple nodes or values with the same name shouldn't be allowed, but this is not only allowed, but also quite useful. By doing this, my mod can retrieve a list of nodes named module and use that list to apply the modules. You would also find lists of module nodes in the stock part configs. Look at some of the engines and you will find that a few also have multiple module nodes. Next, inside the first module node in my example, you see another value called module name and set to the text module reliability igniter. And right after that, another value called rocket parts needed to fix, which is set to a number. Remember that values can not only be text, but also whole or even decimal numbers. Now that we've seen two examples of how the node structure works, we have one more thing to do before we can work with it in code. Let's make a simple config file to use in our code. Open up Notepad and type up the following text. Feel free to pause if you need more time. Once you are finished, save this file in your mods folder. If you don't have a mod folder, all you have to do is create and name a new folder inside KSP's Game Data folder. When you are saving the config file, be sure to change Save As Type to All Files and add .cfg to the end of your file's name. I will name mine settings.cfg. Once that is finished, we can begin working in code. Here we will explore how to save and load the data. Open up your version of Visual Studio and open the project you made in the last episode. If you do not already have a project, you can find out how to make one in Episode 3 of Volume 1. Once your project is open, create a code file by right-clicking on your project in the Solution Explorer selecting Add, and then selecting New Item. This dialog will appear. Select the Class option if it is not selected already, rename your new file to Example Loader with no spaces, and click OK. We will be doing something a little unusual with this code file. Instead of attaching it to a part as a module, we will make it load during the flight scene as an add-on. Add-ons will be discussed in the next tutorial. So for now, just remember that add-ons load on their own in any scene you want them to, without being attached to any part. To make this happen, we need to add a line just above the class definition. On this line, we will add a class attribute called KSP add-on. The KSP add-on attribute tells the game that this code file is an add-on, which should load on any game scene we wish using the startup parameter, from the loading screen to the tracking station. There is a second optional parameter which, when set to true, prevents our add-on from being created more than once in a game session. In this case, our add-on will not be loaded again unless the game is restarted. To write this attribute, you must start with an opening square bracket, and follow that by the text KSP add-on. After that, type in opening parenthesis, and then KSP add-on dot startup dot flight. Follow up with both a closing parenthesis and a closing square bracket. This is all we need to load our add-on in the flight screen. The next thing we will do is add a string variable called string to load and an integer variable called number to load. Next, we will add a function called awake, which will be called automatically just after our add-on is created. In this function, we will load the config file that we recently created. Add this line to the function. This line is creating a config node object called settings and loading our file into it. It should be noted that one config node object contains one node and everything inside it. When we load a config file, we are creating a config node that is set to the root node of that file. Because we made a node inside our file called settings and placed all of our values inside that, we have to get to that node to access our values. Doing this is as simple as calling get node from your variable. In my next line, I am retrieving the settings node and reassigning the settings variable from the root node to the settings node. Once we've done that, we can now access the values inside it. But before we just go around pulling values from a node, we have to ensure that the values are there in the first place. This can be done with a simple if statement combined with a call to the function has value. This function will return true if at least one value exists with the name you've given it. There is even a similar function for nodes as well. Once we know the value exists, we can ask for its value. So inside this if block, we assign the string to load variable to its corresponding value by calling get value. Next up, we will do the same thing for number to load. 
but there's a bit of a snag here. The getValue function always returns a string, even if the value you've asked for is a number. But because we know the value we've asked for is a number, even though it's given to us as a string, there is a way to work around this. Before assigning to the variable, we must first parse the string. To parse something is to take data that is in an unusable format and give it back in a usable format. In this case, we must parse the string into an integer. This is easily done by calling int.parse. This can also be done with other formats, such as floating point numbers, long integers, or even double precision floating point numbers. But keep in mind that when writing your configuration loaders, your code relies on the assumption that the values you're trying to parse are what you hope they are. If they are not, then the attempt will cause an error. There are some ways to avoid this, like catching the error and rewriting the value to a default, but I'll leave that exercise to you. So we've loaded our file and accessed the settings node and assigned our variables, parsing when necessary. All we need to do is test to be sure everything loads properly. The next few lines of code simply display the variable in a GUI in the flight screen. Feel free to pause and copy if you wish. Here is a screenshot of our settings being displayed in the game. So now your user has modified some information and wants to save it. Fortunately, that's very easy to do. The first thing we need to do is to create a new empty config node and add a new settings node to that. So here, we create a new node with no name, and then we call add node with the name settings. Calling add node gives you the newly added node back, which is useful, since we have to add some values to it. Next, we call add value on the new settings node, giving a name of string to load and the string to load variable as the value. Next. We add a value called number to load and use the number to load variable as the value. If a value you're trying to save isn't a string, you don't have to worry since the add value function can automatically convert most values into a string. Lastly, before we actually save to the file, we're going to add a third value called test color and set its value to white and then save it. This will save the color in a string format and serve as a way to test how to build custom value parsers. Once we've added all our values, it's time to save the config node by calling save and using the same file path you used to load it. Next, I'm going to expand the GUI function to include the color so that we can see it as well. Like always, pause if you need to for copying. Once this has been done, build your project, copy the DLL to your mods plugin folder, and run the game. Go ahead and put any type of vehicle on the launch pad. Modify anything you want in the new window hit save, and then exit the game. Open the plugin file, and you should see that the data, including the color, has been saved. Now, we need a way to load that color. As you can see, the color, when saved as text, has a bit of extra information we don't need. So when we write our parser, we also need to remove a bunch of useless text before actually parsing. So let's write our parser. But first, we create a function called parseColor, which takes a string and returns a color. Inside, we first remove the useless information by using the substring method. Note that the numbers I'm using are manually counted, keeping in mind that strings are zero indexed. A string being zero indexed simply means that the first character is character number zero according to the code. Knowing this, we can count the number of letters we need to cut off the beginning, and that number is the character number of the beginning of the string we actually care about. Next, we need to take out the pesky ending parenthesis. This is luckily a bit easier. All we have to do is cut the string one character shorter than its current length. Now that we've trimmed down the string, we need to split it up into its three individual values. We do this with the split function. When we call this function, providing a comma character to split by, we get back an array of strings as a result of the split. Also, the split function takes out the character you provide it as well. Once we've done this, it takes nothing more than creating the color based on the parsings of these individual number strings. Lastly, add in the loading code for the color into the awake function. Rebuild, recopy, and relaunch KSP. Once you get to the flight scene, you should see that all three variables are saving, loading, and displaying properly. If something on your screen doesn't seem to match up to mine, try writing the values in their string form to the debug console by using debug.log. You can view the log in-game by pressing Alt F12. If your problem is with the custom color parser, try logging the three split strings before creating the color and seeing if those look like numbers. If you still don't understand why things are failing, take your time working through the processes one bit at a time 
comparing what you expect with what is actually happening. This concludes today's tutorial, but before I go, I'd like to point out that, when working with part modules, manually saving and loading is unnecessary because it is better to use the KSP field attribute, which automatically saves and loads most variables for you, and can even allow them to be displayed in flight or in the editor. The exceptions to this are double precision values and any custom values like colors. These must be loaded manually in the module's onload function. Applying the knowledge from this episode, combined with that covered in the last episode of the previous volume, it is easy to do just that. So be sure to check out that episode to know more. Thank you very much for watching my tutorial, and if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the comments section. Lastly, if you like this series so far, and wish to see more, please do leave a like, and stay tuned for more episodes on how to mod KSP. But until then, this has been Nifty255.